Voices in Value-Based Care. I'm Beth Hauck. Thanks for tuning in. The movement to value-based care is revolutionizing how healthcare providers get reimbursed for delivery of care. In this program, we're going to explore stories from the field about how real organizations are dealing with this change. You can follow the show on Twitter at hashtag Voices in BBC and follow me on Twitter at VA Hauck. On the program today, I talk to Dr. Mark Friedberg, Senior Physician Policy Research Researcher for the RAND Corporation. Dr. Friedberg, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I know that your research in general focuses on measuring and improving the performance of individual clinicians and healthcare organizations. I'm particularly intrigued today to talk about the study that you recently did on the effects of alternative payment models on physician practices. So I think it's going to be a great conversation. Would you, would you mind just kicking off the, the show by um, telling the audience a little bit more about your type of research, uh, who you are, your type of research, and then we'll launch into that study itself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a general internist. Uh, I see patients on a part-time basis uh, in primary care. And most of my time I spend doing health services and health policy research at the RAND Corporation, which is a nonprofit research institution headquartered in Santa Monica. I'm actually in the Boston office uh, myself. And broadly speaking, the research I do, as you mentioned, uh, focuses on measuring and improving performance of health systems. And that spans from descriptive qualitative projects like the one we'll be discussing today to uh, more quantitative uh, projects and actually even some randomized controlled trials of interventions to try to improve clinical care. I have a feeling there's going to be some fascinating things for us to follow up on at some point just based on that. So maybe you could just uh, explain first the study itself, you know, how, how broad it was, who you talked with, and what you were really mm -hmm. trying to find out when you uh, initiated the study in the first place. Yeah, so this is a follow-up study to a previous study that we did. Um, this study and the one like it, which we did in 2014, were sponsored by the American Medical Association, which conducted the study with us. And the purpose of the study, I'll, I'll explain what we did in 2014 and then explain what we did this time around. Um, in 2014, the AMA was interested in learning how different new payment models were affecting physician practices. So typically when you see an evaluation of a new payment model, like an ECO program or let's say a medical home pilot, uh, the thing that people look at is the effects on patient care. So they look at costs of care, quality of care, maybe they survey the patients and look at the effect on patient experience. And all of those things, of course, are really important. And they usually form the basis of whether or not to continue those pilots or expand them. Uh, what we did in 2014 was um, answer a, a relatively unanswered question, which is what are the effects on physician practices themselves? And, and the, the reason for asking that question is, is uh, uh, two things. Um, first, it's possible to have a new payment model or other kind of intervention that is good for patients for a limited time and it destroys the practices and they go out of business and they take the payment model with it. <laughs> and that's not you know, an outcome most people want. Uh, so it's important to focus on the, the health of the practices and the um, physicians who work in them. Uh, the second reason uh, to do this study in 2014 was to look at the effect of multiple simultaneous payment model changes going on with physician practices. So you know, as I'm sure your researcher, uh, your listeners know, most physician practices have many payers. They might even have dozens of different payers that they have contracts with. And usually when we do a quantitative evaluation of a payment model, when we look at the patient um, care effects, we treat it as if there's nothing else going on in the world. We try to look, isolate the effect of only that one payment model, but that really doesn't reflect reality. Uh, what's going on actually is that you have um, simultaneous, often conflicting payment models being received by um, physician practices and decision practices trying to figure out what to do with all these conflicting incentives. And so we sought to uh, describe that as well. Uh, the study design was to um, interview physician practice leaders and frontline physicians in six different markets around the country. Uh, these were Boston, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, Miami, Florida, Little Rock, Arkansas, Lansing, Michigan, and Orange County in California. We chose those markets because they were six of the 12 in the original community tracking 
uh, study, which is unfortunately no longer in operation, but we knew a lot about those markets based on the good work of the folks who ran the community tracking survey um, up to that point. We also, in each of those markets, um, performed interviews with market observers. So these were folks who were not in the practices, but they could tell us what was going on with decision practices broadly in the market and with um, payment models in the market. And those were leaders of local um, and state medical societies, uh, health plans with market share, um, hospitals with significant market share, and leaders of local medical group management association chapters. So that's like a professional association for folks who um, uh, help run the business side of physician practices. And we published that report in early 2015. And then something else happened in 2015, about two weeks after we published it, which was that MACRA passed. And that changed mm -hmm. everything uh, for uh, 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 how physician practices were paid since uh, it affects all Medicare providers, which is nearly all you know, physician practices in the country. Um, they take some form of Medicare. And so the AMA came back to us uh, in uh, late 2017 and said, we'd like to take another look at this. Let's go back to the same six markets. Let's try to talk to the same individuals to the extent we can. And um, we'll ask about macro, of course, but we also want to know what, you know, how things went since 2014. I mean, a lot of the practice leaders would say, well, we don't really know how to do well in this ACO model. We have some ideas and we're, we're taking our best crack at it, but are we sure? No, uh, we don't know. So we had a chance this time around to go back and say, hey, you told us in 2014 you were doing the following things. How'd that work out? And that's a little bit of, that's actually rare in qualitative research to have that chance to do a longitudinal design. So we, we jumped at the chance to do the study. And um, we were able uh, this time around to go to the exact same six markets to talk with many of the same people we spoke to in 2014. Um, over half of the practices that participated in 2014 also participated in 2018. And we supplemented the sample with some new practices. Now, some of the practices didn't participate in the 2018 study because you know, they were too busy, which I totally understand. They're under a lot of pressure these days. Um, some of them couldn't participate because they no longer existed. About a half dozen uh, just didn't exist as independent practices anymore. Some went out of business completely. Some were um, uh, uh, absorbed into larger corporations or were sold to hospitals. And we, we still tried to interview those folks. And in, in a lot of cases, we were able to interview the same individuals, but we no longer counted them as a, as a repeat practice because the practice itself um, had ceased to exist. And we also talked with the same market informants. And we, we were in the field this time around from about um, the January of 2018 uh, through the end of June of 2018. And then um, at that point, we uh, coded the interviews that we had done and, and wrote the report that was published on October 24th. You validated something that I expected was the case, which is uh, the notion of getting to follow up with organizations in in a relatively short frame, short time frame does sound like a rare uh, kind of research construct. So, so how fascinating and, and helpful to be able to do that kind of longitudinal study. Um, in particular, probably also telling that these organizations either didn't, didn't exist anymore or were acquired because that obviously was also yep. uh, relevant. So right. when you were, when you were talking um, with them, tell me, and I think you can probably draw from either study really, because I think what you were trying to do is figure out what was still the same from 2014 uh, going forward. But tell me a little bit about what you heard around what kinds of capabilities uh, that they had that they had added new in response mm -hmm. to these alternative payment models. Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. In both studies, and this was a consistent finding from 2014, yeah, 2014 to 2018, uh, physician practices were investing in, a, in a, a variety of new capabilities in response to alternative payment models. And for the purpose of the study, we defined alternative payment models as anything other than fee-for-service. So, you know, capitation, partial capitation, virtual capitation, bundles, virtual bundles, um, pay for performance, shared savings, you know, ACOs, PCMHs, all that stuff is, is in there if it had a, a payment component that deviated from fee for service. Um, we found that broadly speaking, in response to any, per, uh, any performance linked payment model, physician practices made investments in a, in a couple of different places. First, especially in primary care practices, um, they tried to augment the comprehensiveness of the care they offered. So a good example of this was uh, primary care practices investing in behavioral health capabilities. You know, whether that was an in-house um, behavioral health provider 
or whether it was a, a better re referral relationship uh, with, a, with a local uh, provider of behavioral health services who could guarantee them you know, better access for their patients and in exchange for, you know, some, for something else like um like a, a specific way of making referrals or for a certain you know, patient volume. Um, you know, th those kinds of things were, were definitely being invested in. And in 2018, you know, which won't probably surprise anybody, we heard a lot more about behavioral health capabilities for the opioid epidemic. Uh, in 2014, I think people were a little less aware of what was going on. And uh, this time around, we heard about practices that were you know, getting um, uh, certified for Suboxone or, um, you know, having formal in-house behavioral health specialists who actually, you know, focus mainly on um, opioid um, uh, addiction. The uh, the other kind of capability that we heard about in 2014 and 2018 that was, you know, pretty, uh, pretty much across the board was um, investment in data management capabilities. So to do well in alternative payment models that are linked to some kind of performance measure, and uh, you know, usually some kind of target where if you go over the target, you get a bonus. If you're under a specific um, threshold, you might even get a penalty. Um, practices really wanted to know um, where they were relative to those targets at any given time for, for obvious reasons. You know, it's a little like climbing a plane. If you don't know where you are in space, it's pretty hard to, to hit your goal. Uh, and um, practices you know, under fee-for-service didn't need to know that kind of thing. Um, they just would track their accounts receivable. And, that, and that's all about, you know, that's about all you have to, to track under fee-for-service, but now there's a totally different kind of data they have to receive, um, often claims data from the payers, and also track internally, uh, often using their EHRs as a basis uh, for uh, tracking performance within the practice. Uh, that was a significant investment for practices, especially the smaller ones, where, and that actually ended up being for the smaller practices a big uh, motivation for them to join larger organizations and be able to use the larger organizations' um, in-house data um, uh, infrastructure rather than having to develop their own. That would make sense to me. We're seeing a lot, a lot in the markets that we serve and the organizations that we work with that the, that while the need for the data is very high, the kind of bandwidth to be able to both support it financially to invest in it, but also even just to have the resources, analysts and people with those kinds of skills to work on it um, is also very hard to implement at the smaller practices. One of the things that we talk about a lot with our customers in the market, and I hear a lot about in the market, is how to put the right incentives in place for clinicians so that they're aligned with the overall organizational uh, incentives that have been put in place because of this new alternative payment model. So if the, if the practice is at risk, how do I put my individual clinicians at risk as well so that I get out of them the behavior that I want? What what did you see in terms of those kinds of let's call them physician comp models or physician incentives to that were aligned or in support of those alternative payment models? Yeah, that's a great question. This is, this is another thing that showed up in both uh, studies. So there's there's two important things I'll say about that. The first is um, in general. Uh, practices did not pass their incentives straight through to their frontline physicians. So they might receive, you know, a bonus uh, or some kind of financial incentive for uh, 150 different quality measures from all their payers and also um, some kind of total cost of care incentive uh, where they're, you know, incentivized to save on costs from a subset of those payers. They did not then just change each individual physician's comp model to say, these are the 150 measures you're responsible for, for your patients that you see. And, uh, you know, for the patient that you see, uh, if you're spending, if their spending is less than target, uh, you get a bonus. And if it's over, you get a penalty. So, that, so the way that the, the practice was paid was not replicated for the individual physicians. And, and they, there are two big ways in which it was changed by the practices. The first was they radically simplified uh, the, the physician payment model relative to how the practice was being paid. So, um, you know, you as an individual physician, I guess the, the the general thought was you can't possibly respond to hundreds of different quality measures. You can't even keep track of them. You're going to sort of have brain lock and not improve anything. And uh, they didn't want to do that. So if you had 150 primary care measures coming in, that might get boiled down to like a dozen or less actual measures the patient, that, that the physicians had to respond to. Uh, 
And they, they were able to do that by um, trying to align the measures they were receiving as best they could. So if you had a whole bunch of measures that had to do with um, glucose control and diabetes, you said, well, we have one standard within the practice we're trying to get all our physicians to. And it might not meet every measure, but it's better than meeting none of them by trying to give everyone a, 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 an individual target for each patient, depending on who their payer is and what contract they're under. The other thing that practices did in both study years was they did not transmit incentives to save money through to individual physicians and individual physician basis. And what I mean by that is uh, primary care docs, for example, were, were not incentivized to save money on their specific, you know, their own patient panels. Now, they might get a share of some kind of bonus that if the overall practice saved money, um, they, they might get a, um, a bonus or even a penalty if the overall practice lost money. But that was not contingent on their own patients saving or um, uh, losing money. Uh, and, and part of the thinking there was that the sample sizes for individual physicians are just too small for cost uh, incentives. And you're gonna be you know, basically rewarding and penalizing doctors on mostly noise if you try to do it on just the patients they see. And uh, the other problem is the ethical dilemma. You know, the, the concern is always that if you, for a, a physician who's seeing a patient in the office, if that, if that physician knows that that specific patient's care, if it's expensive, is gonna come in, to some extent out of his or her own paycheck, uh, that's an ethical dilemma that people really try to avoid. I think some, you know, with the experience of the managed care um, expansion of the 1990s, said we did that in the 90s, it did not go well, um, and we do not wanna replicate that. And so they're shielding their physicians. Um, the other the other thing practices are doing uh, to uh, incentivize their physicians is transforming financial incentives they're receiving into non-financial incentives internally. So a good example of this would be a practice might receive you know a dozen different diabetes measures or um, you know other preventive service measures and say, you know what, we're not going to link those to physician payment at all, but we're not going to ignore it. What we're going to do is we're going to give the physicians an internal report card. And it might list how they're doing versus their peers. It might name them in a way that um, everyone else can see, or it might not. Uh, and you're just relying on doctors' professionalism and innate, you know, competitive um, nature to motivate behavior change. You know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but in the 2018 study, we had somebody tell us. I thought they, they put it very well. They said your doctors are used to being A students. Um, and if you see on an internal report card that you're not an A student. Um, you know, you, you're, you're likely to, to change your behavior and, and they did see performance improvement just from an internal report card without having to link it to payment. I, I've worked in ambulatory settings a, a good portion of my career and I worked at one point in patient satisfaction, patient experience measurement, and now, you know, then meaningful use and now MIPS and MACRA. And I absolutely echo what you just said. There is just nothing better than a little friendly competition to motivate behavior change. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been incredibly effective. Um, so you mentioned this when you were talking about the infrastructure that practices needed uh, in order to really respond to the tracking of alternative payment models. Let's go back to talking about the data again. So what, what else did you learn about the data? Were people able to get what they needed? What was kind of the minimum set that, of data that people were looking at that was useful? And then what, where were the gaps or were there, where were the most significant gaps around data? Yeah, well, so at a minimum, people needed to know who was in their denominator. So which patients were they responsible for during the you know, period of performance they were being incentivized uh, uh, to, to perform under. Usually, you know, it's a year, but sometimes it's more, sometimes it's a little less. So which are, which are their patients? Uh, and once they have the denominator, what, what's the numerator for the different measures uh, that has to be tracked? So whether the numerator is costs or um, receipt of certain services for quality, um, those also had to be tracked. And you had to have accurate, timely, and complete data to be able to, to um, to do well. Uh, when practices were dependent largely on payers, um, we heard not in, not universally, but in a lot of cases, uh, payers were late with the data, data would be wrong, and they would go through multiple re revisions. And, you know, a good example of this was, you know, again, I'm paraphrasing, but in the 2014 or 2018 report, we had a um, primary care practice that was in a, um, in a, a, a payment model where they um, were being paid um, 
based on some performance targets for the year for patients who were attributed to them by a health plan, and they didn't know who their patients were, supposed to be prospective attribution, and we were interviewing them in March or April, they still hadn't gotten their list. And, and it was a calendar year contract. So this is a problem for a primary care practice because a lot of their patients you only see once a year. And if they weren't providing some service for those, those patients and they didn't know the measures yet, they didn't know the targets, um, uh, they were gonna have to call them back before the end of the calendar year if they wanted to, to um, meet the performance thresholds and you know, sort of an unnatural time frame for a patient who otherwise wouldn't need to come back. So they had a missed opportunity for those patients. So the timeliness was um, pretty important. And you know, this practice leader basically told us, it, wouldn't it make sense to just have this all nailed down in December or November of the previous year? Then we'd have you know, the best chance of, of doing the thing the health plan wants us to do and you know, earning our bonus and you know, not making the patients come back an extra time, which is inconvenient for them as well. We, you know, uh, uh, we also heard about operational errors. So this is a this is an interesting thing that um, we heard in 2014, and and, and actually again in 2018, and it had to do with data infrastructure at the practice in the following way. So what I mean by an operational error is a payment model can be designed very well, uh, and everyone agrees that it's got exactly the right incentives in there, has the right exclusion criteria, it's gonna yield you know, good effects uh, for, the, for the patients and the practices are ex excited to make the investments that it then incentivizes them to make. And so there was a, a practice in, in one of the markets in 2014 that was in a bundled payment model that they had helped, um, they and other physicians around the state had helped co-design. Uh, they were pretty excited about it. They made a lot of investments uh, to um, both, both time and software investments to try to, um, uh, improve care under the bundles. They did so, They because they had developed the data infrastructure internally, because they wanted to do well in this payment model, they were expecting a bonus. They had basically replicated internally the, um, the payment model and uh, said, okay, we're expecting a bonus at the end of the year. They didn't get it. So they went to the payer and said, um, why didn't we get this? And the payer said, oh, well, you know, you missed your performance measure here. And they said, well, hang on, that is not at all what our internal data say. And sure enough, the payer had made a mistake uh, and it wasn't, a mistake of design it was just a mistake of execution. You know, some programmer over at the payer was programming something for the first time with these new payment models. It's always going to be, you know, first time for, for each of them when they're new, um, had just programmed something wrong. There was a bug. There's a wrong diagnostic code um, in, the, in the, uh, the, the payment model specification. And sure enough, the payer said, yeah, you're right. We, uh, we screwed up. We owe you a bonus. We'll fix it next year. And so we had a chance this time around to say, did it ever get fixed? And the answer was no, it never got fixed. The payment model actually was canceled before they ever fixed it. And the practice had sort of a sour taste in its mouth um, after that. And uh, it actually affected their willingness to participate in future payment models of the same kind, even though they sounded great. You know, the last one also sounded great and they, um, they, uh, they were not um, reimbursed for their investment. Why this relates to data infrastructure is that the practice never would have known uh, about this operational error had they not had the ability internally to replicate the payment model and to know that they were owed a bonus. So you have to keep your own internal set of books uh, to guard against that possibility. Yeah, I, I completely was, was down that path in my head when you were telling the story. I was thinking, well, good thing that they had the reinforcement because you're right. I think there's plenty of times when they wouldn't have that reinforcement because either they can't replicate the same uh, kind of algorithm that the payer is using because the payer is using adjudicated claims of which they do not have access to, or it's based on an attribution model that, like you pointed out earlier, was, was uh, put in place too late to really, so you were impacting patients, but potentially not the right ones. So um, I, I, it's really fascinating. Um, to kind of kind of bring us home here, um, I, I know you're not necessarily advocating on behalf of the the clin um, of the practices, but you're hearing things and and really doing these studies so that you can bring to light things that will help the pra make this all easier on the practices. What if if you're giving advice for the people designing these advanced alternative payment models or just alternative payment models in general? What what kind of advice would you give around how mm -hmm. these should be designed? Yeah, yeah, and it's not. I mean, it's interesting. Um, it's for the welfare of the practices, but it's also for the welfare of the health plans. Presumably, they're putting these incentives in place because they want something to happen and uh, something good for patients, for their members. Right. And if the practices aren't responding as intended, that's not good for the health plan or the members either. 
Um, so, you know, the, I think these recommendations are sort of, I would say, good for everybody, good for the use and the gander, good for the health plan and the practice and the patient. So the first one is, you know, keep the payment models as simple as you possibly can. There's less room for error in a simpler payment model. It's also easier for the physician practices to understand. And they're harder to game when they're simple. Um, the second uh, recommendation would be to, um, this came out of our 2018 report, I'm just going through the three recommendations here. Um, the, the second one is um, to keep the pace of change in payment models um, moderate and predictable. Uh, right now, you know, we, we heard in 2018, there's a sense that um, payment models are changing so quickly that practices can't keep up with them, nor can the people who are advising the practice on how to respond to them. And, uh, uh, you know, macro is a prime example of this where it changes every year and it's very hard to keep track of. Um, if, if there's a, if there's a way of, um, uh, giving people some time to, um, deal with a given payment model long enough for it to sort of gel and for them to respond in a constructive way, that's probably in everybody's interest. And as long as it's the right payment model, of course, so you shouldn't implement something, um, that you, you know, aren't happy with, um, that you wouldn't be happy with being in place for, for a good length of time. And, um, the third thing is practices uh, between 2014 and 2018 in our sample did become more risk averse to downside risk. Part of that had to do with uh, being burned by downside risk models. And our report details some examples of why that happened. Some of it had to do with high cost pharmaceuticals. And to the extent that there's a push right now towards forcing um, physician practices into alternative payment models that include downside risk, um, there is a chance of disengaging a significant number of physician practices who will just say, I'm not going to play at all. And I will take, you know, my, uh, my penalty and go into um, fee for service. At least I know what that penalty is as opposed to what the downside risk could be, which is a, you know, a quite large number in some cases. Uh, so that, that might not be where payers really want to be. Um, if they, once that happens, um, they have very little um, opportunity to improve care for their members. It might be uh, far better to um, think of ways to achieve goals um, without having to um, to foreclose the option of an upside only uh, contract for for physician practices. Makes sense. So, so so follow the simplicity path, and you will be benefiting from being able to push down some some downside risk because people will ha have some successes under their belt. Well, that is all mm -hmm. the time we have today, and I want to just thank you so much, Dr. Friedberg, for, uh, for all of your insights. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Friedberg, and thanks to our audience for tuning in. You can learn more about the show on the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com and lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at hashtag Voices in BBC, and be sure to follow me on Twitter at BA Hauk. I'm Beth Hauk, bringing you the voices in value-based care you should hear. Until next time, have a great week.